Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining our first public forum for the Swampscott Public Schools. We've got an exciting program planned out for you tonight, and we're very excited that we have so many attendees here participating on our first Zoom meeting. Today's topic, before we get started into discussing all of the sites that we had evaluated, taking you through the process and the much anticipated conversation in traffic, I want to let I want to first introduce a few members of our team as well as let you know a little bit of the rules of engagement for tonight. First and foremost, my name is Vivian Verbedian from Hill International. I'm the owner's project manager for this project. Along with me from Hill International is Mr. Paul Callis. He's, um, he's a little bit silent at the moment, but I'm sure you'll hear from him eventually. From the architectural team from LBA, we have David Harris as a project manager, Lee Sherwood as one of the principals, and Rebecca Brown from GPI, who is acting on their behalf as the traffic consultant. So we will run through our presentation as efficiently and effectively as possible. Please be patient with us. This is our first time ever doing it in this type of a format and fashion. Afterwards, we will open up for questions and Q&A session. We're hoping to leave at least a minimum of 45 minutes. Definitely, if uh, time allows and people can uh, stay on, we'll be more than happy to answer all of your questions. If for any reason you are unable to um, participate in this manner, we will also be um, presenting another option for you to send your email questions or phone calls or however you need to communicate with us. And uh, we'll try to get those answers to you as soon as possible as well. All right, without further ado, I'd like to turn this presentation over to David Harris and Lee Sherwood from LBA. This is Lee Sherwood uh, from Lavalley Brensing Architects, and uh, David Harris is, is leading uh, the show tonight, and I will start talking. I just want confirmation that everyone can hear me. Yep. All right. Yes, let's yes, Lee, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, really, uh, this is the start of doing community forums uh, online, and we have already met a couple of times in person where we talked about uh, enrollment and we talked a little bit about um, all of the important things that were key to project success. Tonight, we're going to talk about two things. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, we're going to talk about our site evaluation process. And the pro so the process that we've gone through to try to limit sites in the town of Swampscott. And then after that, we're going to talk about traffic, which we all know is near and dear to everyone's heart in Swampscott. So uh, when we first started this a couple of months ago, the, we decided that a, a strong process was in order. You do not have a site that screams out, let's build a school here. And we all know that Swampscott um, is a small uh, geographic community with a lot of wetlands, a lot of ledge, and very little um, land that is left to build on. So our process has been thus. One, the first thing we did was discuss, and we discussed with um, SBC members and other people in town to come up with uh, what we all thought was a good list of uh, different sites. Next. The next part of the project was to um, investigate. Now, we are architects, but we have employed traffic consultants, geotechnical, civil, environmental consultants. Oftentimes, we don't use all of these consultants, but in this particular project, we've used everyone. And so we really, really spent a lot of time looking at various sites. Next. Then we analyzed, and it is our task to be as objective as possible. We know that there are many people in town who have grown up here, who understand Swampscott and, and many of the sites, who know a lot about a lot of these places. But it was our task to look at everything with fresh eyes and to understand them 
with all of these different facts and the analysis at hand. And lastly, um, our job is to review them with you. Um, we take this very seriously because this is a community effort. So what we're starting to do today is start the, um, start the review process to show you some of our findings and to move on from there. Next. So the very first thing we did um, was to throw a, a wide net on all of Swampscott to understand where all of your town owned properties were. This is available information. So all the red um, um, pieces on there are, are public owned land. Now that's a lot of different places and our job then was to start to limit and to figure out which of these are actually usable and which are not. Because as you know, there's probably not that many that are usable in town. Next. We started with conservation land, um, the town forest and Ewing Woods. So each time that I talk about these, you'll see a red, the red will come up and show you which of these ones we're talking about. Neither of those locations are buildable because they're conservation land and therefore protected. Next. So we eliminate those from our thought. And then there are a lot of other kinds of protected land in Swampscott. Clearly the, um, the Swampscott Cemetery, Jackson Park and Playground. Um, Lynn Scott Park is a historically protected and Abbott Park was, is a protected um, land as well. So we could not use any of those sites. Next. So then what we had were um, sites that were wetlands or, or places where because of topography, it was difficult to build. For example, um, Water Tower Hill which is on the side of that embankment, really can't build a school there. And, and, uh, and the town beach is fairly wet as well. Um, Forest Ave right in front of the middle school is, is all wetlands and also cannot be built upon. Next. Um, and then uh, we have our existing public project locations. So there's a couple locations where you have public housing, which cannot be relocated. You have historic down town hall and library um, parcels, the fire and police department areas, and Swampscott High School is also already being used, and Clark School as well. So if you take into account all of those places, you can't build on, you click. And as you can see, we're getting fewer and fewer locations that are um, appropriate to try to build on. And lastly, if you look at this, there's lots of little tiny slivers of space. They might be just an, an area here or there. And we anything that was less than an acre, um, Hadley's an acre and a half. So um, anything less than that really is, is really just hard to build on or impossible for a school like this. And some of those were um, areas. So we took those out and we ended up with five uh, sites that had feasibility Next. So that was a process of elimination. And then the reason we did that is because we really wanted to have a, a laser focus for our um, consultants and, and ourselves to focus in and really analyze these different places. We know after looking at all these that none of these are perfect sites. We know that the DPW site already has a DPW on it and a cliff in the middle, but what if we could build a school there? We know that the middle school site um, already has a middle school, but has land in the back. So we were going to look at that. We know that Stanley has some space and we know that Hadley, although small, has a school on it already. And lastly, we know that Phillips Park uh, is a site that is possible to build on. But I just wanna say that next week, um, today we're really going to focus on uh, traffic but next week, we're going to have a really in-depth study of all of these five sites with analysis of all of our different engineers um, combined so that we can really understand the pros and cons uh, of all of them. Every single one of them has some kinds of issues. And there may be a couple sites here that in the end, we, just, we really kind of discovered were not very good options. OK, so we'll have to wait till next week to learn all of that. But I think it's really important tonight 
to really focus on traffic because here we have the opportunity to hear from Rebecca Brown, who is our traffic um, engineer, who has spent a lot of time observing, studying, and coming up with options uh, for the town of Swampscott. So I'm gonna turn this over to Rebecca and have her sh give her presentation. And I believe at the end, we'll take um, questions. All right, thank you, Lee. Can everyone hear me okay? Rebecca, can I just pause for one moment? Um, hopefully, you, if you are watching this um, on YouTube or on the TV, you can see, uh, change my profile picture to the email and the phone number for you to call if you have any questions, or you can text that number as well. So as you were progressing through this, if you have something that you would like to share with the group, Rebecca's going to do an amazing presentation. Um, but if you have any questions that you would like us to address at the end, please email sbc at swampscottps.org or call or text 617-821-5075. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So I'm gonna walk through um, our observations of the, the traffic at each of the sites. Um, so as Lee already alluded to, we had a total of five sites that we were really looking at, and that was the, um, the existing Hadley School site, the existing Stanley School and Middle School sites, and the Phillips Park site, as well as the, um, the DPW site that um, I don't believe that Lee actually did mention. Um, and there were really six different categories that we looked at when we were evaluating the traffic, and that was um, traffic congestion, safety, the student density, the walkability around each school, uh, the queuing in terms of pick up and drop off uh, queue storage areas, and parking. Um, and I'll explain how each one of these is important as we kind of go through each one of them. Um, but we went into this process really with no preconceived notions about any of the sites. Um, we treated all of them the same. And as far as we were concerned, everyone in the class started with an A. Um, and it was up to them to really keep it as we walk through each one of these pillars here. Um, so if you want to advance to the next slide. So the first thing that we looked at was really traffic congestion. Um, and the biggest component of, of traffic congestion is all, obviously the vehicular volumes. So we mapped out all of the roadways within the town in terms of their functional classification and the volumes of traffic on each of the roadways. And you can see here that the roads that are shown in red represent your arterial roadways that carry the heaviest traffic volumes through the town. Um, the roads that are shown in the yellow color represent the, the collector roads that carry kind of intermediate traffic volumes that are kind of carrying traffic from the local roads onto the arterial uh, roadways. And then the gray roads are showing the, the local roads that are generally low traffic volumes. Um, and one of the reasons that this is important is because locating a school on an already congested roadway can exacerbate the situation um, causing the road to exceed capacity. And the reason that's so important in a community like Swampscott is because there's very limited ability to actually expand any of these roads and provide additional capacity because of uh, limited right of way and existing buildings uh, right up against the edge of the roadway. Uh, so we really wanna try and maximize the capacity of the existing roadways and not create additional congestion. Uh, congestion also can be a deterrent to walking to school, um, which can create then more drop off and pick up activity and create more congestion, creating kind of that never ending cycle. Um, so we've ranked each one of these schools here on this map in terms of um, the congestion that's surrounding the roadways. And we've ranked them from most favorable shown in the dark blue color down to least favorable shown in the light blue color. And if you look here, you can see that the DPW site and the Phillips Park site are located right on Route 1A and Route 129, which are heavily congested roadways. They carry high traffic volumes um, and adding additional traffic from a school onto those roadways could create an even worse situation and could also be a deterrent for um, people walking and biking to school as well. Uh, the Hadley School is kind of 
it's located close to Route 129, but it is off on a side street on Reddington Street that's a little bit less congested. And the middle school sites and Stanley school sites are, are located on uh, low volume local roadways uh, without a lot of congestion on them. Uh, no. Rebecca, this is yeah. Lee. Um, a big question that's being asked is the timing of your study. Did you look in the morning when it was congested? Did you look at traffic uh, times and things like that? Can you explain that methodology? Yes, absolutely. So that was one of the things that I was going to mention is so we've we've created all of these kind of nice maps, which maps are great, um, but really the, nothing is better than observing traffic. Um, so we did actually go and do observations at each one of these sites um, during the morning drop off period and the afternoon pickup period. Now, obviously at the Phillips Park and DPW sites, um, there's no active pickup and drop off going on, but we did observe existing travel patterns in those areas around those sites at that same time so that we would understand what impacts the additional traffic from a school being added there might have. And I will uh, later in the presentation walk through all of those observations in detail um, and talk about what type of impacts we would expect in terms of additional traffic and queuing and all of that from each of um, from the a new school being located at each of those locations. Do we want to advance to the next one? So the next thing that we did was we mapped the student population. So we got the addresses of all of the, the students in grades K through five and mapped them out as you can see here. So the, the dark areas represent high concentrations of student population while the lighter areas represent uh, low numbers of student population. And ideally you wanna locate a school close to the center of the student population because it reduces the number of vehicle miles traveled for uh, parent drop-off and pickup activity for vehicles getting to school, um, which thereby also reduces the traffic congestion. It also maximizes the walking potential for people getting to the school. And one unique aspect about Swampscott as well is that there's currently no busing provided because of having three neighborhood elementary schools. So by providing a, um, a school that is central to the population of the entire town, you could potentially provide a consolidated school that also would not have a busing requirement. Um, so here we can see that the Hadley School and the DPW school sites are located very close to the center of the majority of the student population. Uh, the middle school site is a little bit further away, but still pretty close to a, a very high um, source of, of students um, right nearby on the, on the Forest Avenue um, corridor. The Phillips Park site is also relatively close to the student population, but starts to get a little bit further away. Um, but one of the important things about the Phillips Park site is that uh, Route 129, because it is so congested, really creates kind of a barrier to a lot of those kids getting to school. Um, and then last is the Stanley School that starts to get a little bit further away from the majority of the population. Do you want to move to the next one? Uh, so this one is evaluating safety, which safety obviously is important and, and was really the primary concern of, of all of um, our review. Um, if it is an unsafe situation, people won't walk, which will create more congestion and um, thereby creating more conflict near the school and creating an even more dangerous situation. So what we've done here is we've mapped all of the crashes that occurred over uh, the latest three-year period. Um, from 2017 to 2019 within the town. And what you see here is uh, the, the red and, and yellow and red areas represent um, the concentration of crashes. The blue and green dots that you see represent pedestrian or bicycle related crashes. And what we see here is that the, the DPW site is located uh, right on Route 1A, right where there is a very high concentration of, of crashes at the driveway. Um, the Hadley School site is located a little bit off of 
um, Route 129, but there is another crash cluster located route, right on Route 129. And both of those schools have a lot of pedestrian crashes also in the surrounding area. Now, the majority of the ones near the Hadley School on Route 129 are actually happening during the summertime and are more related to people going to the beach. Um, but again, it is still a, a vehicular crash cluster as well. Um, the Phillips Park School is located just a little bit up the street from a crash cluster on 129. And then the middle school and Stanley sites are located on uh, more low volume roadways that really don't experience a lot of, a lot of crashes. Want to advance to the next one? Um, so really all these things are, are highly related to each other. Um, the best site is really one that's kind of central to the student population that doesn't require much of the population to cross over uh, busy, dangerous roadways and is in a kind of a low volume safe area. So what you can see here is kind of that area that becomes sort of the sweet spot for locating a, a school in an ideal world that's highlighted in the, the yellow dashed area. And we see that the DPW site and Phillips Park site are kind of right on the borders, but really outside of kind of that area that um, provides safety, low congestion, low traffic volumes, um, and, all, and close to the student population where the middle school, Stanley school and Hadley school sites all kind of fall within that range. You wanna to advance to the next one? So the next thing that we looked at was um, the walkability of the areas around the school to assess what's the likelihood that kids will walk um, to the school. So what we've done is we've taken that student population information that we had previously shown and we looked at various walk zones around each of the schools, showing a, um, a quarter of a mile, a half a mile, a three quarters of a mile, and a one mile walking distance. And that's walking along each of the roadways. So it's not as the crow flies, but actually walking along the roads. And you can see those shown in the, the various purple colors on the map, where the dark purple represents uh, people within the quarter mile. Um, and the lighter purple colors go out to a one mile radius around the school. And then we compared these to the walkability rankings for each of the school or the walk to school scores um, for each of the roadways. And those scores get calculated based on uh, the geometry of the roadway, the volumes and speeds of traffic traveling on the roadways, uh, whether or not there's a sidewalk provided, whether there's a sidewalk on both sides of the road, and what the condition of that sidewalk is, as well as whether or not it complies with ADA requirements as well. Um, so what you can see here is that the darker colors represent a road that is very walkable, um, where sidewalks are provided, um, it tends to be lower volume roadways, or there's some type of separation between um, the, the vehicle traffic and the pedestrian traffic. The lighter blue colors represent the low walkability roadways where there may be steep grades, there may not be sidewalks provided, or there may be high traffic volumes that are a deterrent for walking. And what we see here is that the majority of the roads surrounding the Hadley School are very walkable roads. They have very high rankings of walkability. And there are about 500 out of the 900 total uh, K through 12 students that fall within that one mile walk zone. So there's a high likelihood of, of capturing a large number of the students um, that would actually be walking to school on fair weather days to the Hadley School. Do you wanna to advance to the next one? So we did the same thing for each of the other schools. So this is the Stanley School here. And you can see that for the Stanley School, because it is located a little bit further away from the population, um, that there's only about a little under 300 students that fall within that one mile walk zone. But one of the great things about the Stanley School is that a lot of those roads do rank very high in terms of walkability, particularly the roads that are immediately adjacent to the school. Um, so there is a, a high potential of capturing a lot of those 300 kids as walking to school. Want to advance to the next one? Uh, so this one is the Phillips Park site. And Phillips Park is similar to the Hadley School in that it captures about 400 
kids within that, um, that one mile walk zone. But one of the things that's important to note about the Phillips Park site is that Route 129 is a heavily, heavily congested roadway um, and that the majority of the student population is actually located on the opposite side of, of Route 129. Also, a lot of the roadways on the north side of Route 129 have very steep grades, making it difficult uh, for kids to walk on those roadways, um, particularly for ADA access on those roadways. So that's likely to be a deterrent to walking to school that doesn't really get reflected when you look at um, just the walking map of, of where the student population is located. Do to advance to the next one? Uh, so here's the, the middle school. And again, middle school is very similar to um, the Hadley school as well. Um, about 450 kids fall within the one mile walk zone. And those roads surrounding the middle school are also very walkable. Um, so it's likely that a high number of those will actually walk to school. And I think that also gets reflected when um, we did observations at the middle school because a very large number of the middle school students were actually already walking to school. Um, so it's likely that if there were an elementary school located on the site, that a lot of those students would walk to school as well. And the last one. So the last one is the DPW site, which is very similar to Phillips Park. It captures about 400 kids within the one mile walk zone. But again, Route 1A cuts right through the middle of that walk zone and really creates a barrier for walking to school. Um, in fact, for Route 1A, it's probably even more a barrier than along Route 129 because there are a lot of um, high intensity commercial driveways that are located along Route 1A. Um, that really create a barrier for pedestrians trying to walk as they experience a lot of conflict with vehicles turning in and out of the driveways, um, even walking along Route 1A. And the grades in that area also make it very difficult um, for pedestrians walking to school. Um, so if you wanna advance to the next one. So as I mentioned before, um, looking at the maps is great, but obviously observing traffic and how it actually operates is uh, really very important. So that was one of the things that we did go out and do was observe traffic during, it, during the morning and the evening hours um, to see how things really work out here. So this is looking at kind of the, the Hadley School and the area around it. Um, and I'll kind of walk through our observations, kind of going from the left side of the page over to uh, the right side of the page. So one of the issues with the Hadley School is that there's really no off street queuing area for pickup and drop off activity to happen. So as a result, long queues form down Reddington Street for about a 30 minute period every morning. Um, and then again in the afternoon. And one of the difficulties in the afternoon is that parents are um, kind of competing to be the first one to grab their kid and get out of the area. So parents are arriving long before um, the school actually releases and trying to use any parking spaces that are available in the surrounding area um, to wait for school to be released so that they can pick up their kids and get, get out of the area. So this results in, in long queues forming on Reddington Street, as I mentioned, and some um, queuing and capacity issues at the signal at Humphrey Street and Reddington Street as well. There is a crosswalk down at the Humphrey Street intersection where uh, vehicles parked on the street will actually park across the crosswalk, blocking access to the crosswalk and creating sight line issues for vehicles that are trying to exit out of Reddington Street. Uh, there is a crosswalk that is located right in front of the school, um, right at the intersection of Blaney Street, but it's not marked um, and it's not ADA accessible. There's no ADA accessible curb ramps to that crosswalk. And the queued up traffic for pickup and drop off activity blocks visibility of that crosswalk, particularly in the afternoon um, when kids are walking from the school towards Blaney Street. Uh, that queued traffic up against the school sidewalk um, blocks visibility of pedestrians walking in that area. 
there's also a section where there is legal on street parking allowed between Rockland Street and King Street. And the, the on street parking in this area kind of forces the traffic that's headed south down Reddington Street into the oncoming lane. Now that also happens as vehicles queue up for drop off. Um, through vehicles will pull out around them into oncoming traffic, which creates the potential for a head-on collision. There's also a very wide pavement area um, in between Rockland Street and King Street, um, and there's no marked crosswalks in that area for kids walking on the opposite side of the street to get to the school. Moving a little bit closer up towards Sheridan Road, there's a section of sidewalk there that's in deteriorating condition, it's, it has very limited curb reveal there um, where someone could actually drive up onto the sidewalk in that area. And there are also a number of large trees that are blocking the sidewalk. So when we consider all of these things, it, the question that often gets asked is how could you possibly accommodate any more kids on this site with all of these traffic issues that we've just identified? So Lee, if you want to advance to the next slide. So what we looked at was what options are there for how we could improve traffic in the surrounding area to be able to accommodate traffic. So right now, one of the things that happens kind of naturally is that traffic sort of creates a one-way pattern um, around the school coming in on Monument Avenue and going along Elmwood Road, up Sheridan Road and back down Reddington Street. Elmwood Road today is a one-way roadway in the direction that's shown on this graphic. So we would propose formalizing that one-way pattern all the way around um, as a policy and directing traffic to utilize that as, as a route into and out of the Hadley School site. Reddington Street itself would become one way headed southbound. And this could be done either by time of day, um, just during school hours, or as a permanent conversion. Uh, doing it as a permanent conversion has a lot of safety benefits as well as uh, parking benefits for the surrounding neighborhood, um, which I will walk through and describe to you. Um, so with providing a, a new school, there is the ability to provide some off street uh, queuing area right in front of the school for pickup and drop off activities. But based on the population of the school and the number of parents that we saw actually dropping off um, already with a neighborhood school, that is still likely to back up out onto Reddington Street. So that area wouldn't be long enough to accommodate all of the queue. But by converting the roadway to one way traffic flow, you could create a, um, a stacking area for pickup and drop off activity along the side of Reddington Street and use what was formerly the northbound lane on Reddington Street as a through lane for traffic to continue flowing south down Reddington Street. And this would provide some overflow parking too for um, events that might happen at the school or uh, weekend traffic and traffic for the beach as well in the summertime um, to be able to provide some parking in that area. Um, we would also recommend removing that wide open pavement expanse between Rockland Street and King Street. And that could be done in a couple of different ways, either by constructing a large um, bump out and landscaped area in that way that could be used um, like a pocket park or by adding in um, head in or angled parking in that area as well, um, which would provide some overflow parking uh, for the school. And then also converting King Street and Rockland Street to one way roads to help to uh, disperse traffic as it's coming in and out of the school area um, along King Street, Rockland Street and Blaney Street, as well as alternative routes to um, dispersing all the traffic out through Humphrey, Humphrey Street. Um, Converting those to one-way roadways also has added benefit uh, where Rockland Street right now is, is two-way and has on-street parking. Um, and because of its narrow width, people are actually parking up on the sidewalk right now, blocking access to the sidewalk. Um, so by converting that to one-way uh, 
on street parking could be accommodated within the existing pavement width and the sidewalk could be kept clear for pedestrians walking. If you wanna to move to the next slide. So this slide is really just summarizing all of the um, items that we looked at for the Hadley School in terms of congestion, safety, student density, walkability, queuing and parking. And each place where you see um, the green plus indicates that the site is, is able to meet um, the criteria for, for that one item or that it is in some way beneficial in terms of that one item. Wherever you see the yellow circle is really neutral. It means that there might be issues, but there are ways to overcome them um, or that they're not, not major issues, but things certainly to be considered. And uh, a red minus, although one doesn't appear for the Hadley School, a red minus means that the site really doesn't work well for that item. So we evaluated all of these schools on each of these six categories um, and also looked at in terms of the enrollment options. So um, the Hadley School site is already working for um, the existing enrollment of about 390 students but it could also work for an, a larger enrollment of 540 to 565 um, students with option one or two. Um, so overall Hadley is located um, in close proximity to a large portion of the student population. It has very walkable streets, um, but it is located close to congested route 129 and all the traffic exiting would have to go out towards route 129, um, which is a crash cluster as well. And there is limited ability to provide off street uh, pick up and drop off areas and parking. Um, so some concerns, but overall it can work at the, the Hadley School. So the Stanley School site um, is a little bit unique because it has very limited parking on the site itself. So all of that parking is reserved for staff. As a result, all of the parent uh, traffic is parking along Orchard Road and Nason Road out in the neighborhoods and then walking their students in um, onto the school campus. There's also a um, one-way circulation pattern that happens right now on Orchard Street, which is not signed very well right now. Um, there are some signs that just uh, out on Humphrey Street that say no left turn between 7 a.m and uh, 2 p.m. I believe, or 3 p.m. And so it's not signed very well. There's no do not enter signs or anything like that to let people know that that pattern is really happening. Um, so it can create some additional congestion with all of that traffic having to come in, parents parking along the streets, walking their kids into the school, and then coming back out again. Although there are sidewalks provided along both sides of the street, there are also large trees that are located in these sidewalks that are all circled in red. And in some cases, those trees completely block the sidewalk. Um, there is in a, um, a couple of informal trails that go through the wetlands just to the south of the school and connect into Forest Avenue um, to the east and over to the Unitarian Universalist Church to the west of the Stanley School site. And there were parents observed using that walkway as well to walk their students into the school. And a number of people were also observed parking in the church parking lot and then walking their, their kids into the school as well. Um, one of the other things that we did also notice is that parents were parking up along Nason Road to drop off and pick up their students for both the middle school and the Stanley School as well. And we did notice a high volume of traffic that was flowing back and forth between the middle school and the Stanley School using Forest Ave, Laurel Road, and Nason Road as well. Um, because they have staggered start and end times, parents would drop off their kids over at the middle school and then cut across over to Stanley School um, to drop off their, their elementary school students there. There are a couple of busy um, crossings along Humphrey Street as well that are indicated here with a number nine um, that don't have any signage um, to highlight the, the crosswalks. And then the intersection of Humphrey Street, Atlantic Avenue and Puritan Road, which is shown at numbers 13 and 14 
is very awkward. It has a skewed angle to the intersection, which makes it wide. Um, there's poor sight lines created by the geometry of the intersection and some of the islands that are located um, within this, the intersection to divide traffic actually um, block the sight lines for vehicles trying to exit the side streets. Um, although there is a crosswalk there located uh, at number 14, just south of Puritan Road, um, and it is a signalized crosswalk there, that signal doesn't comply with design standards and the location of the signal heads is very hard to see as you're approaching the signal um, coming around the corner from Humphrey Street um, or from Atlantic Avenue to the north approaching that. Um, so again, looking at kind of all of these things, you, you would kind of question, how can a school possibly work here? Uh, so Lee, if you can advance the slide. So by constructing a new school out in the field, um, next to the Stanley School. You can keep the Stanley School open um, while the new school is constructed. And you can create sort of a large one-way roadway that would circulate around the outside of the, the school campus and create a long storage area for pickup and drop off that could occur at multiple locations um, along the school property as well. By moving all of the parking onto the site, it gets the parent traffic out of the neighborhood and reduces the congestion as well. And then formalizing the one-way pattern along Orchard Road would help to reduce conflict points along that route by keeping all of the traffic flowing in a circular pattern, which would mostly occur all by right turns. It would be similar to the way a giant roundabout works. Um, where everyone would be circulating in a right turn pattern. Um, the one way pattern also allows for the widening of the sidewalks into the roadway to avoid impacts to the trees and allow pedestrians to still be able to have a clear path to walk to the school. It also still provides an area for on street parking for the surrounding neighborhood to utilize um, while still keeping traffic flowing on, on the side streets. And it reduces some of that driver confusion over um, the time of day for the, the one-way pattern as well by formalizing it all the time. Uh, there is also a rail trail, a future rail trail that runs um, that dashed line that you see up at the top of the page um, where you could provide a potential connection to that rail trail um, to increase the walking and biking to the school. Um, this option also allows for traffic to enter the site via multiple um, entry points to disperse the traffic and reduce the impacts to the surrounding roads. So you can disperse traffic out over Humphrey Street to the north and south and out Forest Avenue as well um, towards the middle school through multiple entry points. Um, by providing a connection over to the church, it creates another dispersion point and a potential for um, overflow parking for the school as well. Um, and also provides an opportunity for a, a pedestrian connection through the church property um, to provide a formalized walking path that would be ADA accessible into the school. Um, with all of these improvements shown right immediately adjacent to the school, we would also recommend um, upgrading the two pedestrian crossings that I mentioned out on Humphrey Street, um, which would likely have uh, some type of flashing beacon at them um, to enhance the visibility of those crossings. And then somewhat of a complete intersection reconstruction down at Humphrey Street and Atlantic Avenue to kind of realign those roadways, tighten up those um, radii for those turning movements, reduce the crossing distances for pedestrians and provide an enhanced um, pedestrian crossing that would likely be signalized as well. Uh, Lee, can you advance to the next one? So again, we kind of ranked all of the items for the Stanley School. And while the Stanley School is located central to the student population um, for generating walking trips, it's also located on um, uncongested roadways and it provides ample area for creating a long storage and queuing area. Um, it also provides the opportunity for multiple access and egress points uh, to help disperse traffic along. 
you want to advance to the next one? So this is the Phillips Park site. And I'm going to go a little bit quickly through the, the Phillips Park site because I know we're getting tight on time. Um, but also to kind of highlight that really th this site doesn't meet a lot of the criteria. We mentioned already that Route 129 is heavily congested. Um, the majority of the student population is on the north side and would have to cross over Route 129 to get into um, a school at this site. The existing driveway is narrow at its throat, so it would need to be widened to accommodate um, two-way traffic flow into the site. Although there are um, several residential roads immediately adjacent to the park, Lodge Road, Muriel Road, and Charlotte Road, that could provide um, additional access or egress points into the school. Those would also, providing a, a driveway through there would have impacts to the parklands and reduce the amount of parkland available here. And really it, it would still force all traffic back out onto Route 129 in the end. So it's still creating that congestion on Route 129 while adding traffic into a residential neighborhood. Um, so that one really wasn't an option for providing um, any type of dispersion of traffic here. Um, as I did mention that there are steep grades as well on a lot of the roads opposite um, the Phillips Park site as well. So this graphic is showing kind of what a school at this site would look like. So you can see there would be one driveway into the school that would come in and um, kind of circulate around right in front of the school to provide a drop off area and then go back out onto Humphrey Street. Because of the, the volume of traffic that would be coming in and out here, um, it's likely that a traffic signal would need to be installed out on Humphrey Street. And with the volume of pickup and drop off activity that's likely to happen here because walking would be so low, those queues are likely to extend back up onto Humphrey Street, uh, creating additional congestion along the roadway. Uh, there is some parking area that is available shown it at number nine, um, but that area may also be um, flooded at times um, based on some of the wetland impacts, um, which I believe will be talked about more next week. Um, but overall, what we found was that the Humphrey site really wasn't a great location in terms of meeting um, each of these criteria. If you want to advance to the, the next one, so we can see that it's located on a congested, congested road. It's close to a crash cluster. Um, it's a little bit further from the student density to begin with, but then the majority of the density that is close to it is on the opposite side of Route 129. Um, the roads around it are not very walkable, um, and there's very limited ability to provide queuing, and that queuing could back up onto Route 129, and again, limited availability for um, parking as well. Want to advance to the next one? So this one is the middle school site here. Um, so the middle school works kind of in conjunction with the Stanley School. Um, you can see here that the traffic that I mentioned previously up along Nason Road where parents drop off up in that area. Um, the biggest notable item for the, the middle school, I think, is really the queuing that happens and the congestion that happens right in front of the school um, during particularly the morning hours when parents are coming in and trying to drop off in the school driveway right in front of the door to the middle school. And one of the things that we noted for why this is actually happening is that there is a crosswalk located right at the front door to the school um, where there's a section of sidewalk that's missing that's shown on this graphic in red along the south side of Forest Avenue. And a large number of kids are walking along Forest Avenue on the opposite side from the school, um, coming from the west up towards the school, and then crossing right at the school driveway to get up to the school. There is a, um, a crossing guard that's located there to, to stop traffic to allow these kids to cross. But because of the location of the crosswalk to the left or to the west of the driveway, these kids have to first cross Forest Avenue and then cross the driveway, basically crossing that heavy, heavy left turn volume that's turning into the school twice. 
Um, and because the crossing guard is having to stop traffic twice for each pedestrian, it creates these long queues that extend back on Forest Avenue in both directions. And in some cases go all the way up Sargent Road as well. Um, do you want to advance to the next slide? So one of the ways we looked at trying to improve this is actually um, completing the sidewalk along the southerly side of Forest Avenue so that kids can walk in um, entirely on that side without having to make two crossings of the roadway. And the kids would then cross um, on Forest Avenue where you can see the new crosswalk proposed at number eight. This would allow for the crossing guard to, to uh, stop traffic that's headed westbound on Forest Avenue and allow the pedestrian to cross the road at the same time that traffic is turning into the middle school itself and will really help to alleviate that, that traffic pattern that's happening right at the front door to the school. Um, but that's not really the issue. The issue is a, a new school here. So we looked at the potential for a new school on the tennis courts um, back behind the middle school. And to accommodate this, we would provide a one-way entrance only driveway from Nason Road that would circulate around the ball fields at the back of the school um, and come down through the rear parking lot and then circulate back out onto Forest Avenue. So it would have its own dedicated entrance to provide its own queuing area for the pickup and drop off activities, but would have a shared egress out onto Forest Avenue with the middle school traffic. Um, right now, the, the lower parking lot of the middle school is very underutilized during the day. Um, so that parking lot could be used to accommodate parking for the elementary school. Um, it, that parking lot would not be large enough though to accommodate a 900 student school. It could accommodate a 540 to 565 school, but not a 900 student school. Um, and with this, we would, oh, so with this, we would also recommend providing the, the pedestrian connections over to the Stanley School as well through the church property where that could again be used as um, an offsite area for parking um, or an overflow area for parking and could also be used in an alternative uh, pickup and drop off area as well. You wanna to advance to the next one? So this one is kind of summarizing how we rank the middle school. So the middle school is located on uh, generally low volume, low congested roadways with the exception of that area right in front of the middle school driveway. Um, on roads that experience low uh, collision patterns. It's close to the student density. It's on walkable roadways. Um, but again, queuing and parking are the big issues for this school um, where there's some constraints there on the availability to provide a drop-off area and um, adequate parking for schools of varying sizes. And that's why you see at the bottom that we've ranked this high in terms of accommodating options two and three but not so great at accommodating option one. And option one really creates a, a lot of traffic concentrated all on one area by having um, all of the middle school and all of the elementary school kids in one area. You wanna to advance to the next one? So the last one is the DPW site. And again, I'll go kind of quickly through this one because um, really this site didn't work particularly well for a lot of reasons. So. While the DPW site is located close to the Abbott Park and the Future Rail Trail that provide um, benefits to this school location, it's right on Route 1A, which is a congested roadway. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of curb cuts um, for commercial curb cuts along the road that create a lot of additional conflict. Um, there's some intersections with wide open um, curb cuts as well that um, have long pedestrian crossings. Um, the grading of the DPW site itself um, is also an issue because from front to back, the site goes up by about 30 feet in elevation. So the grading there is, is also um, difficult. Do you want to advance to the next slide? So with this site, there's a very small area to be able to accommodate um, only a handful of cars for a pickup and drop off activity. 
um, which would likely result in large queues forming out on Route 1A that would create ad additional congestion along that roadway um, that only has one lane in each direction now. Um, so that has the potential to create a gridlock situation. Uh, the only really available area for parking would be back behind the school, which would have to be accessed from uh, the residential neighborhoods via Franklin Avenue and Suffolk Avenue. And that parking, again, would be separated in elevation from the front of the building by about 30 feet. Um, there's also very limited space available for a play area um, on the site as well. So that, that, um, that area is very condensed. In terms of improvements, we have shown here um, a numerous sidewalk improvements, closing up some of the curb cuts or narrowing the curb cuts um, to reduce those pedestrian crossing distances, installing um, hawk signals, which are the um, they're signals that are black unless they're activated by a pedestrian, and then they change um, to yellow and red uh, to stop traffic. So installing those right in front of the school to be able to cross traffic over or cross pedestrians over the, the traffic as well. Um, but really in the end, once you do all of those pedestrian improvements and everything, the queuing becomes the big issue where um, traffic has the potential to back up onto the roadway. If you wanna to advance to the next one. So this is kind of showing how the DPW site was ranked. Um, where it's on a congested, congested roadway right next to a high crash cluster. Um, even though it's close to the student population, Route 1A is really a barrier to about half of the population walking to the school. Um, the roads are not very walkable. There's really no space for queuing um, and there's not much space available for parking as well. Um, so really the, the DPW site just didn't stack up on any of the levels. You want to go to the last slide? Um, so this last one, um, we developed a matrix for kind of evaluating all of these, which this really just provides a summary of how each site stacks up against each of the items that we talked about. Um, and as I mentioned before, kind of everyone in the class starts with an A at the beginning with the dark colored arrows. And as they fail each test, um, that arrow kind of drops in color. Um, and when we move to the end of kind of moving through each of these pillars, you can see kind of how each site stacks up against each other. And what we see here is that the middle school and Stanley school sites um, are pretty similar in that they're beneficial in about four of the categories, um, but they do have a couple of issues that need to be overcome. So both schools are located in low congestion, safe areas. Um, the middle school is more central to the student population um, and it falls within the, the walk zone for a large number of, of students, but there is less space available there for providing um, pickup and drop off, queuing and parking as well. And the Stanley School is kind of the opposite where there's plenty of space for queuing and parking, but it's a little bit further away from the student population and would have less biking and walking. Um, the Hadley School is kind of middle ground where um, it's a little bit more neutral. It's close to the population and walkable, uh, but all of the traffic would have to empty out onto Route 129, which is um, a busy roadway. And there are constraints on the available parking and queuing that um, could be provided as well. The Phillips Park and DPW sites ranked very low when addressing nearly all of the criteria really. They're both on heavily congested roads um, with close to crash clusters. Um, they're cut off from a large portion of the population because of the congestion. Um, and they have the potential to create additional congestion and safety issues because of their inability to meet um, offsite queuing and storage areas as well. Um, so overall, this is kind of showing how, how things fall in terms of traffic. This certainly isn't the last step in the process. Um, there, there's always the grading on the curve. So there will be the other items that um, Lee will talk about next time with the environmental and site related issues that these will also be weighed against. So um, with that, I'd say we can 
switch over to questions or Lee, if you had anything you wanted to add. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for that extremely in-depth analysis of the different sites. I think all of you can probably imagine how much that took. Now, and um, I also want to say that there'll be a lot of questions. I'm starting to see them come up. Some of them might be best to answer next week, but um, when we look at each site again, but not just in terms of traffic, but um, we'll do our best to answer what we can this week and to, and to, and have you come back, okay? So how are we going to uh, start this? So um, I'll start, I have a list of questions here. There's already uh, eight of them that have come through. Great. So, um, more like seven, but we'll start with answering these in turn. If it is something that is related for next week's topic, please feel free to just say, please stay tuned and we'll respond. You'll, the response to this question will be coming in the week to follow. So the first question is, in the last failed vote, there was insufficient play area at the middle school. Where would the play area be located at the middle school site and what is the size of it to accommodate a K through five study bot, uh, bot student? Okay, um, that's a great question. I think that, so when we do this, we should probably go to the place where that is. Um, so we should go to the middle school slide, the new middle school, yeah. So um, those, that's probably a question that we can answer more in depthly uh, next week because what will happen is we'll actually show you a diagram of play and coming in and all of that. Um, it, is, it is tight back there because there are already three, you know, the three baseball or you know, fields back there. What we were thinking about uh, next week is to show you that the lower field, um, the smaller uh, little league field there could become part of the school play. And um, with the tennis court in that field right there next to it, be, par be part of the, um, the elementary school project. And that would leave the other two schools. Um, that may not be a sufficient answer, but it's the best we got for now. And next week when we show it to you, it'll be more diagrammatic in terms of showing all the different pieces. But also, what I, go ahead. I was just gonna say as a clarifying factor as well, the student population as well as the option one school for the district would not be from K through five. It would be from K to four. So there's a little bit of a difference there in the number of students. Yeah, I think that everyone's pretty much aware of the, um, the four different enrollment options at this point. Um, what is being said by Rebecca here is that option one, which is the 900 students is just too big for the middle school site, but two and three, which would be either a district three through five or a half district K through five um, may be able to fit there. No, I was more clarifying for the person that asked the question. Their, their question said, would it be able to accommodate a size school that is a K through five? And none of our options offer that from K through five. It would be either from K to four or you know the other um, configurations. Correct, and I will get more into that next week about the size of the school. And we actually do show um, diagrams of the block of the school on the site so you can get a better sense of it. These are a little more diagrammatic for traffic. Okay. So the next question also was a lower and upper Stanley ruled out, thus making it a smaller project. Clark would be K through one, Stanley would be two to three, and upper Stanley four to five. Um, we didn't set the enrollment that was set by the town and the MSBA, those options, the four options. Um, someone from the town may want to address that, but it is my understanding that Stanley would not be able to fit uh, by itself two grades for the entire district, because that would be upwards of 14 classrooms. I think it has 10, and the same with um, Clark only has 10 classrooms. 
Um, so the enrollment that I think you're talking about is the idea of having a three through five as the school and then having both Clark and Stanley become K through twos and splitting that um, enrollment. And I think that does work. Does Martha want to say something about that? If, if Martha Raymond doesn't want to speak to that. I'm no, I, I can, I, I, I guess I wasn't quite sure. So the option was keep Clark open K to two, keep Stanley open K to two and build a three to five at Stanley. Yeah. Well, that was our option, but the question was, did we ever think of saying Clark was a K one, Stanley was a two three, and 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 then the next the new school was like a three four, four. five. A so five, four, five. so the reason you can't we we couldn't do that is that we have to have um, all grades must have an accessible school, and Stanley is not accessible. So you would you would never be able to put all the third. All those, all the second graders at Stanley, because we have to have one building that's accessible for second graders. So we wouldn't be able to do that. that that's why we wouldn't. Have one, of the, one of the things for everyone to keep in mind as we next week talk more about enrollment is that this project is for one of these enrollments. But if you choose one of the enrollments and build a school new or or renovated, but probably new. Um, it does not fix, this particular project does not fix um, Clark or Stanley. It does have no money, it was, you know, it, it, it's not addressing those issues uh, at this point, because that's, this is a limited project through the MSBA. And that's a, that's a DESE requirement. Let's not just, like, that's just a requirement. You have to have an accessible building for, you know, not all the kids have to be there, but we have to have one that's open. It's good thinking though. Next. Also, also this, you know, um, having it broken up this way might even add to the exasperation of the no space for play issue. That's also, you know, something, something to consider. But next question, is the church amendable to the town using their parking lot for access to a new school at Stanley? That can only be answered by someone from the town. Um, Michael, you want to say anything? Are you on this? Are you on this meeting, Michael? I am. Sir. He is. Like. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, that is something we would have to discuss. Uh, but given the uh, limited range of options, it's something that we would like to keep on the table at this point. Next question, an elementary school at middle school site failed previously because we are looking at compounded density and traffic, not density and traffic in isolation. There is no perpetual access and the peripheral. school is peripheral, sorry, there is no peripheral access and the school is sited in a wetland. Stanley site is the clear choice for a 900 student building. Um, well, we there's a, so, uh, Rebecca, I was going to say we did note that as far as um, a 900 student school, that the middle school location would not work um, in terms of handling traffic, particularly because it does consolidate all of the traffic at one location. Um, providing a smaller school, um, you know, a, a district three through five school um, where K through two would be accommodated at the Stanley School can actually work because it disperses the traffic over all of the, the various roadways. Um, as I mentioned too, a lot of the congestion that's happening on Forest Avenue right now can be fixed with a pretty minor fix. And we would recommend that regardless of whether or not a school happens at, at the middle school location, that that still get done to help alleviate traffic right in front of um, the school on Forest Ave. So Rebecca, I think there's going to be some um, uh, some cynicism, you know, clear cynicism about around the middle school, um, because this question actually says we are looking at compounded density and traffic, not density and traffic in isolation. How do we how do we talk about that? Like, obviously, there are a lot of if you add another school there, 
the question would be, are we adding, you know, we're, we're putting, does the timing of the two schools help? Does, does having a separate entrance help to, to alleviate the flow? You're the expert. So maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yep. So adding a school there doesn't necessarily double the traffic that's coming in because we mentioned before in talking about the Stanley school that we saw a lot of traffic that was going back and forth between the middle school and the Stanley school. Um, so there's there will be parents who will come to this area to drop off their middle school student and then they'll be able to continue down the hill and through the parking lot and drop off their kid at the elementary school and come back out. So not every trip to the middle school is brand new or every trip to, um, to the school, the elementary school on the middle school site would be brand new. Some of that's already coming into this area. Um, the other thing is that if it were a consolidated school, it would be replacing some of the traffic that's happening at the Stanley School now and just shifting it over um, to a different location where some of that traffic's already coming through these neighborhoods now as well. Um, Okay. Yeah. So I'm not well, sure. I, I want to make the point that um, for all of you out there in um, in Zoom land, that what we're trying to do is is show you the very best solution we can come up with if that building were on that site. We're not necessarily telling you which is better or what you know we're evaluating, but it's your choice. And so if it looks like so, you know, we're listening to what you're saying about this. So our job is just to show you what we think is the best approach to it if we had to do it. All right, thank you. Next question. Yeah. And obviously there will be wetland implications and all of that associated with constructing this option. And that's something that will be talked about more um, in the next presentation. But um, this is just showing kind of the possibility of, of putting a road through here and putting parking in this location, but there will be other implications related to the site as well. There's a, there's a lot of things to avoid back there. There's wetlands, there's, there's a pool, um, there's pools, there's, um, there's certain um, species that we have to look at and there's a lot of ledge. And so we're trying to do it so that we avoid as much of that as possible. And then let's face it, if we do use the tennis court and use the uh, smaller field to do a school back there, the town and the people in it would want to try to replace that in another location, which is always, right? It, which is always a um, concern. All right, Next. thank you. Next question is, can someone explain why at some sites school options are listed as NA? Example, the Stanley site. Yeah. Um, so if we go to the Stanley site and you see where it says, it might say NA, um, that's a good example. Uh, so if we were to build, if you go to the Stanley site, uh, just logically, and if we were to build, the, we can build the 900 um, student school there, which is the largest one, you could build that, Stanley school could be there. And then after you're done, you, you could tear down Stanley and build a field and have enough room there for the new school. If one was to put in a three through five school there, unfortunately, you would still need to have Stanley um, after that was all done. So if I built a three through five there, I'd still need Stanley and Clark both in place, which would mean there would be these two schools on this small site, which we find to be unfeasible. So therefore it becomes an NA like how do you, and how do you do that? Same with a, um, so option two and three are kind of, you, you need to have Stanley there. We also didn't consider option four there, which is a small Hadley, just Hadley school, because then you're, what you're basically doing is taking the small Hadley school and putting it right next to the small Stanley school and neither one of them has much play space or anything like that. So you can see the conundrum each site allows for certain enrollment options to happen based on what else is on that site and what the uh, phasing throughout town is. Um, so in the case of Stanley, I think we find that uh, the 900 student school is the one that fits without getting in the way of any of the other projects. 
I don't know if that's a if if you go if you if you um, tune in next week when we go through this, I think you'll get a, even a greater understanding of each site and which enrollment option works best for those sites and why we wouldn't consider certain ones on there. Next question is: Will this new site require voter approval? Um, that is something that I'd like the, the town to answer. Agreed. I think um, what it does happen is we're trying to show you all of the options and all of the available sites in town, trying to narrow it down to a few good possible options that are potentially, you know, that can accommodate all of the various options. And it is based on which option fits best on which site that I think um, the process of elimination will happen. But Suzanne or Michael, anybody else from the town, if you guys want to add to that, please do so. Hi, it's Suzanne. I, I mean, um, ultimately, we're gonna narrow down our choices from a lot to a little, and then probably have a preferred one or two and the school committee will take the first vote on on which option um, they want to push forward the school the school building committee will also have a vote on an option and then ultimately the funding will will go to the town and that's where the town will decide and so so the town isn't going to necessarily vote for a site it, it doesn't it doesn't work that way it sort of goes through the whole process and they're going to vote for a building on a site that makes sense yeah if that's the if that's the question um um i guess the yeah i guess the we, what we want to do is we want to pick the site that you all feel will get the best voter approval Agreed. that's why we're here suzanne I think, may i i think the yeah. reason why we hold these public forums is to get a little bit of sense of the uh, the community and what direction they would like for the new school building construction to go to. It is our intent with these public forums to kind of extract opinions and interest as well as comments. We, you know, the town has to get direct input through these forums. That's why these are so important. Michael, you have something to add? Sure, no, I, I think those points are all well made. The, the challenge is we do need to start a whittling down process, we can't afford, I mean, as the financial representative, we can't afford to send these experts to look at every possible site. The um, uh, having them do a full workup of the DPW site seems like a poor use of taxpayers' money. We will wind up with a reduced set of options and there will be a vigorous discussion at town meeting about them, I am sure. Absolutely. It, I feel as though it's already self-evident just going through Rebecca's presentation and her final slide that some options are not necessarily worthwhile to continue any further. First one being the DPW site, just because of all of the negativity that it brings in regards to the congestion, the safety, the walkability, queuing and parking for a for that site to accommodate a school. And the second with the um, you know, next most negative marks would be the Phillips Park with the issues of congestion, walkability, and queuing. If we already eliminate those two sites, we've narrowed it down to three sites and whatever educational configuration options will be met on those three sites is something that we can take a further in-depth look next week and present. So I hope that answered that question and we'll move on. And if not, please don't hesitate to, you know, send further questions or we'll figure out a way to have a more in-depth conversation a little bit at a different forum than this Zoom meeting. Next question, if the middle school site is selected, what is your plan for alleviating the traffic that already backs up onto Forest Avenue during drop-off and pickup? 
Yeah, so I think that was kind of discussed. I don't know if that question came in before or after we went over that slide. Um, yeah, so we talked about um, providing a separate entrance into the school off of Mason Road to try and disperse that traffic um, and provide a separate queuing area for the pickup and drop off activity to occur that will get some of that traffic off of, um, off of Forest Avenue. One of the important things to note here is that the middle school and the elementary school do have staggered start and dismissal times. So it's not really compounding all of that traffic um, at the same time. So it's really only about a 15 to 20 minute period right now where that traffic is all backing up at the middle school and then it's gone again um, in the morning for, for the drop off. In the afternoon, it's a little bit longer because people are parking on the streets and waiting in advance before the kids get out and everything. Um, but still within, within about 10 minutes or so of school releasing, all that traffic is gone. So what we're basically doing now is we're putting a similar amount of traffic in the next half hour where um, you know, from, from roughly 7.30 to eight right now in the morning is crazy. Well, now we're gonna make it a little bit crazy similarly from eight o'clock to 8.30 too, to be able to accommodate an elementary school at this location. Um, so we're really just spreading out that peak instead of compounding it and making it twice as bad as it is today. So the duration will just be a little bit longer, but the pain will still be the same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. The next question is, how does that fit with educational vision? Um, I guess my answer, my question is, how does what fit with educational vision? Agreed. I'm not quite sure. Maybe Jaron asked a question earlier. Um, let's look to see if. Let's see. Did Jaron ask a question? One of the questions earlier. I, I remember the name. He wrote in the. What I meant was adding a small. Okay. He what wrote I meant in the was at field field vote, field. there was insufficient play area in the middle school. Where would the play area be located at the middle school site, and what is the size of it to accommodate a uh, K through four student population? So I'm assuming he's referencing this question. And with the educational vision, the K through four, which is option number one, would satisfy more of um, the district wide. Therefore, it would become more equitable for the student population from kindergarten to fourth grade. Anybody else have anything else to add? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know for sure if we answered the question because I can't. Um... So Jaron, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please ask the question one more time. Okay, I see it later. It says educational vision. How was, how does the K through four fit the educational vision of removing grade five from the middle school? That's, that is an excellent, and now I get it. Um, the, so we have four enrollment options and next week we do take into account educational, especially district vision. The, the, Enrollment options that that um, create equity, grade level equity, seem over and over to be the most um, the most uh, preferred by faculty, by staff, by district level, everyone. So the three through five, um, which is district level, uh, sorry, yeah, district three through five, which brings all those grades together, is preferred, and the K through four is also preferred and that's 900 students. The issue with that one is that what you're saying, Jaron, is that it, how does it deal with the fifth grade and some people's um, uh, and many people's uh, hope to be able to take fifth grade and re-enter it back to the um, elementary school um, people. And, uh, one of the options that we're looking at, or one concept, is that instead of a K through four district, 900 student school, is the idea of a one through five district, 
because we, we can't get bigger. Um, that's the, the biggest school we're allowed with the MSBA right now. And we could look at that as an option. The thing that would we have to overcome is what to do with kindergarten. And I know that other people have, um, have opinions about that. Thank you. I hope that answered that question to the best of our ability. Hopefully it's the beginning of an answer. Um, we, we do only have certain enrollment options that are have been accepted. Next question, I think it was already um, previously answered. Do we have permission to use the Unitarian church property for the Stanley option? It is um, early, earlier it was answered that we are in discussions and looking to for various options to accommodate. It is not uh, definitive at this moment. Next question. Again, more comment than question. The middle school site is a bad choice because it does not provide a one school solution to the entire elementary school. And also since we need a plan, um, a to plan long-term, it would inhibit our future need to build a new middle school behind the existing middle school to replace the existing middle school, which really needs replacing. Um, uh, it says Sus Suzanne would like to answer that. Is that true? Uh, um, I'm happy to answer that. I mean, I mean, yes, 100% agree with you, Angela. We have to think about, in this process, we need to think about all our schools. and. And you're right, if we build a school back there, it makes putting another middle school on that property really difficult. Like maybe we could build it on the bowl now instead. Or maybe if a three through five gets built there and someday we put a new K through two, maybe that goes on Hadley and then the Stanley property becomes available for a new middle school. But, but we do have to think about those things and we do have to weigh we do have to weigh what we do today in and how it affects our future. And that's a compromise, you know? So maybe this isn't the best option because we can't build a 900 student school there. So, so maybe building a 900 school and school on the Stanley site is the best option. You, you know, it's just, we have to look at, we have to look at the things we value and the things we want. And then we have to make some compromises because nothing's going to, Nothing's gonna be perfect for everyone here. And um, I 100%, I've been saying, everyone on the building committee can agree that I say this all the time, like we need to save the middle school for a middle school renovation. So that's, that's my bias too. But we also, we also do have space on that property for two schools if that's what happens too. <laughs> I just think this is all part of this discussion. This is why we need your input and everyone else's input because we have to really weigh all these questions and all these, these ideas to figure out you know, what compromises we're gonna be making. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah. Agreed. I'm also, there's, I'm noticing that there are 25 open questions. Thank you everybody for submitting these questions. I'm going to instruct everyone to kind of run through these questions a little bit quicker in responding. If okay. there is something that can be answered quickly, let's do so, so that we move on to the next question. If for any reason we are unable to fully explain or provide in-depth in information on one of the questions, we'll make sure to tag it and respond accordingly. So yep. next question. Um, I think that one's from Jaren, so I'm going to, um, I we believe we already answered that. I would, um, I would support a 900 student elementary because we will need a middle school soon. Well, that, thank you. Exactly. So, so we say thank you thank for you. those comments. You don't have to, there's, it's not a question, so you don't have to nope. answer it. Thank you. Thank you. Need to understand that the roadway between Stanley and Middle School going through the Unitarian Church property is indeed a town road. Yeah, there is a um, there is a right of way uh, shown on our map, and we'll show it next week. That connects Forest Ave to the small Forest Ave, and that there is a um, an intent um, to have a, that connection there. Um, even though there's some wetlands in the way. And we'll look at that more in, intensely next week as we zoom in and look at all the environmental and traffic, uh, you know, more issues. But that's an excellent observation. Thank you. 
At what point is the grade configuration decided? The town needs a one through five, so that should rule out the middle school. Three, five would not make sense there. Um, I don't, three through five would not make sense there. Suzanne, you wanted to answer that? Um, I. No, you, it just said for some reason it says your name there. Um, I would just say that um, at what point, I think that what's happening here is that we've been talking to all the faculty and everyone about grade configuration. And many people have said that grade configuration needs to be um, merged with the site choices too, so that everyone understands, you know, what the combination best answer is. Uh, but so far we've mostly heard that um, the, the district level um, uh, enrollments are the, the most preferred. I don't know if three through five does not make sense. Um, it's a smaller school and it's, um, it's a smaller school and it allows um, Stanley and um, Clark to remain open for the smaller kids, but we can talk about that more. Thank you. Next is the church has an easement over this street, which is essentially a paper street section of Forest Ave. I think we already right. kind of addressed this comment as well. So thank you. Correct. Are you assuming seven sections per grade as it is now with more for bubble years as it is now, despite a bit of a MCAS dip with larger class sizes? Sorry, I had to ask. I do think the committee did a great job with more detailed data on these options, but the educational aspect is the most important. Right. I think what we'll do is we'll talk about that more next year, next week. But um, yes, we are we are looking at the seven the seven classrooms per overall grade for the whole district. That's what you have right now. You have three, two, and two in the in the different schools. We've been having uh, faculty programming meetings to go over all those things. And we've, um, we have demographic studies uh, that have been agreed upon through the MSBA that pretty much support that same um, line of thinking. Lee, we do have one bubble. We have kindergarten has eight sections. And, and kinder, kindergarten has eight sections. And it might even be more, the, the MSBA program actually has more kindergarten um, sections shown in their program spaces. And that's because it is their assumption in that, in their um, educational methodology that kindergarten should have smaller um, number of students in each classroom. But we'll, we can talk about that more and more as we meet with all the faculty. Obviously, Jaron, I don't know if I've spoken to you before, but you know all about the education and we agree that the educational vision is really, really important here. Thank you. Next question. Does Rebecca have any thoughts or input on how busy, busying may help at any of the proposed sites? Busing. Busing, I'm sorry. Mm. I not even have my glasses on. <laughs> yeah, so um, certainly busing would help to alleviate traffic congestion at any of the sites um, by reducing the number of people that are uh, dropping off and picking up their kids. So um, we haven't done any estimation for that because um, it was our understanding that there was a desire not to um, have that additional um, infrastructure expense for having busing. But um, if that was something that wanted to be considered, it could. Thank you. Next question. Does the town plan to utilize the traffic study data to migrate issues at our existing schools, no matter what site or configuration moves forward? If so, under which departments can constituents follow that progress? Example, select board, DPW, school committee, superintendent's office. Suzanne, would you happen to know the answer to that? I don't. Um. I, I mean, Sean's, Sean's an attendee right now, so I, he, I think he can't answer. But I mean, the data's here. Why wouldn't, 
why wouldn't we use it? I mean, Rebecca mentioned like, no matter what, we should fix the problem at the middle school. I mean, yes, <laughs> right? Hey, Suzanne, it's Peter. Oh, good. So I think the, the two things I saw tonight that the select board with a recommendation from the traffic study committee can easily do is the um, improvements to the middle school, the extension of the sidewalk, and also um, on Reddington Street, the bump out to slow traffic as examples. But there are multiple things that I've seen tonight that we've never seen before that are great ideas and the town should act on. Thank you. And, okay, given the overall traffic safety analysis across the town, is the town prepared to and or interested in mig migrating or addressing these issues moving forward outside of the elementary school building project? Example from Stanley's slide, the current dangerous crossing with light that doesn't conform to current design standards as intersection of Humphrey and Puritan. Absolutely. I think Peter kind Peter of again? Answered, kind of answered that yeah. question. Yeah. A little moment. They are going to look into it. I don't think there's anything more to add at this point. What are the education philosophies, pros and cons linked with a 90 primary elementary school? Have other communities similar in to ours created a school of this student size? I think the um, I think that's something we should talk about next week, um, but. Believe me, that has been that has been discussed, and we've actually had enrollment um, meetings where we've had people put down the pros and cons um, of building of doing the larger and the smaller. Other communities have done uh, large schools, 900, 900 um, student uh, primary elementary schools. The key to all of them is to create small learning environments. So when people talk about a neighborhood school, if you imagine taking a couple of neighborhood schools, putting them together, but they feel like they have smaller communities within them, um, that has been done successfully. I believe it's also probably been done unsuccessfully. So it'd be very important um, to do that correctly. Um, the, the, in terms of education, the pro is that you've taken care of all of your uh, educational needs at the same time in your whole town for the next 75 years. And you've also integrated special education throughout instead of moving kids from place to place. And you've also created equity for all the kids in the whole town. And those are really, really important parts of all of that. But it's really also important to create small learning uh, communities, which we can talk about more. Thank you. Um, this looks like more of a comment. Agreed, last vote failed because site was all wrong. We have heard I, so many reasons why the right, vote failed. I, I was it, gonna answer that. I think we've heard so many reasons and <laughs> reasons on why the last vote failed. I don't think it comes down to one in particular that the site was all wrong. It could also, we could also be looking at the same exact site, but looking at it from changing and reconfiguring the entrance and the traffic flow that will make it the right site. So all of these are being taken into consideration. Unfortunately, Swanscott is a small neighborhood, so there, there isn't that many options to consider and to look at, and we're doing our very best to take the pros and cons on for all of them, and I hope that is self-evident. Thank you. Has a bus option been considered while assessing traffic? Busing has also been taken into consideration. Granted, we're trying to minimize the amount of busing that is necessary in looking at what selection of site options there are. I know that a few options, especially for the Hadley location, some of the other schools do have um, small amounts of busing. So if it, there is a need for additional busing and the student population lives outside of the two mile radius, Busing would still continue. 
Agreed with Michael, do not waste time on options that will never be options. Let's focus on and get this done. Thank you. <laughs> um, We're trying. Thank, thank you. Um, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. We apologize for the rough technical start, but hopefully the information was communicated um, properly to everybody. Thank you, Angela. When you say potential use of the Unitarian Church parking lot, could that realistically happen? Would it be very it would it be very important factor to add traffic flow through there? I I would like to say, you know, Rebecca, we've talked about this. Um, Rebecca felt that if if for some reason the Unitarian Church parking lot wasn't available, that it could still be made to work with all the other improvements. Um, but logically, and again, I, I um, asked the town to go and, and talk in person and start to work on that. Um, logically, the Unitarian Church parking lot is, seems to be not used during the day um, when the school is open. And many of the parents actually go in there and drop off their kids and walk them across through the little woods there because they have to walk them onto site and they utilize it anyway. If we can use it, it'll disperse traffic in two different directions and be, a, be very exciting and a very uh, good thing. And uh, maybe they're, so I'm hoping that you of the town figure out a good way of addressing that and so that we can pursue that. Thank you for that, Lee. Next question. Do any of the current five sites shared tonight align with previous recommendations or other observations made by the failed vote task force? Um, Suzanne, you were, or Pam, or someone who was part of the, of the task force? Yeah, it's Pam. Yeah. Um, I just Hi, wanted Pam. to, I, I just wanted to say that I think some of them, and Suzanne, you can correct me if I'm wrong, there's a couple that are the same, but um, I think the most important fact is that this team came in independently and looked at the town as, in, you know, as new people coming in. So I think what you have before you tonight is some very unbiased, you know, people coming in from the outside, looking at our town and what's best for our town. So, you know, coincidentally, were there a couple of sites that came up in that task force? Yes, but I think it's coincidental because I think you came in with a fresh set of eyes, looking at our town, looking at our community, and that's how this was done. I mean, the truth of the matter is there's a limited amount of sites. So yes, of course there was overlap. <laughs> yeah, and we and people have told us all about the, the um, observations and recommendations of the task force. We see the task force as a, an important moment in your, the life of your town where you actually, after something came together and shared honestly, and that's all we've wanted is honest um, feedback. Can, can, I, can I make a suggestion while we're going through these questions? There's a, there's a lot of questions by the same people and I think we should answer them all, but let's just answer some of the questions by um, some new people and then go back to the people that have already asked questions because I know there's also some questions that were emailed that I sent you. So I just wanna be able to be cognizant that everyone gets a voice because I see some people on this list that haven't asked questions yet. So if okay. we could just so, maybe skip around a little bit, like go to Neil. I'm actually question. gonna, I'm gonna go from the bottom up instead of going in or order. Whatever, I mean, just, I, yeah. I, think, I mean, I think so, it's great. Like everyone has great questions and I think we should answer them all, but maybe some of these people that have been waiting. Yeah, no, okay. agreed. So I'm gonna go to the last question asked. Why couldn't a road be built around the Hadley School building for pickup and drop off, saving Reddington Street from becoming one way and borrowing only a small amount of land from Linscott Park. That park's utility would not be affected by a one lane road along the backside of the building. It's well, a great question, however. Well, I, th I, think, um, I think there are different parts of that question. One, the first part of the idea of going around um, the building and looping around and creating a longer queuing line could, um, 
could be of benefit to you know the drop off there. Um, I don't know if if that would if that would stop you from making improvements on Reddington, because I think that with all of the cars there and everything, it might actually just be one of the improvements that you make to make it even better. Um, I will say that Lynn Scott Park is a protected air um, in per in perpetuity or something like that, and um, and has its own rules. And there is there is nothing that I know of um, that would allow the town um, to to um, take any of that historic site. You can talk about that if you'd like, but it's we just don't even um, have access to it. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's correct. It, except for if we move the building closer to to Reddington Street, of course we could fit an access road. I mean, I mean, it would we, have to be on the land of the of the Hadley site. Right, we, right. We could try to fit something back there, and it's not a it's not a bad idea. It depends what the shape of the school is, right? It's it's something to consider. I mean, right now it's not in. I mean, right. It's, it's but I think the substance of the comment was. Uh, can we just borrow some from Lynn Scott Park? I, I do not believe that there is such a thing. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thinking outside the box, though, we like that. Absolutely. Uh, another question that is from an anonymous. What are the cons of a 900 student school? Um, from what I have been told and and we know um, the cons of a 900 student school are the size of the student body and faculty and all of that and how to make it feel and function as smaller learning communities. Imagine taking a 900 student school and making it into two or three smaller schools connected. So it's combined and it can share resources, but the, um, the way to do that is to say, okay, this is K through and one, and this is two and three, and this is four and you know four or something like that, and create smaller areas. Um, and then uh, other cons are that it needs more um, it needs more site space for parking, and that the amount of cars that have to go to that one spot um, are compounded because there's more kids there. So there are cons to it as well. Any cons we would have to try to overcome through good design and planning. Yay. All right, thank you. Another question, I think this, there might have been a confusion, so I would like for this mm -hmm. to be clarified. Lee mentioned that the MSBA would not allow a K through five town-wide school. Could we build one that size at Stanley and self-fund the added cost of the extra classrooms? It, Um, I think what maybe Lee was mentioning, I don't want to speak for you, Lee, was that the MSBA's um, program as it is right now, not that the MSBA dictated this, but the community, Swampscott, when submitting their application to the MSBA, put it out as a K through four. Mm. And hey, Vivian, I'm just yeah. going to interrupt you. We actually did ask the MSBA for a K through five first, and they they told us no because we were replacing a K through four school, and um, that it was going to be it, it it had a lot to do with what their budgeting was too, and how much more it would cost, and how many more kids would be in it for them to fund it, and they they didn't want to they didn't want to fund a school that was bigger than nine hundred person school at the time because we were looking to replace a K through four and they were already adding on Clark and Stanley as part of kind of the options that we got to look at. Mm -hmm. So, so it was an MSBA decision not to do it, but, but we could, we could as a town decide that, that we want to self fund some parts of the school. And I, I, I mean, that's it is definitely something that we can kind of exactly. kick around and keep in the back of our minds, but However, at the moment, none of our the options represent that. And also, I think the available sites 
Well, that's a that's a bigger that's problem a because question. because the K through five all of a sudden brings us up to you know more than um, probably ten and a half like a thousand yeah. fifty or a at a hundred students at another hundred and seventy five. So, right. Um, so uh, so that's and that's you know we we're having a hard time with a nine hundred student school to to add another hundred and seventy five students is is a lot. But it's a logical question. Yeah. No. It's it's definitely consideration. Thank you. How does a, another one from an anonymous, how does a larger school of 900 fit? Um, I think we answered something. Well, this is about, I just want to, I want to key in on this. It says social and emotional wellness. I want to um, um, Martha. say that social and emotional wellness is one of the, the most important factors in your elementary schools in Swamp Scott, as Pam would attest and Martha would attest. And it's, it's part of the philosophy of how you teach. So it's very important that should we do a school of any size and a larger school especially, that we understand the, um, and are aware of how this works with the students, you know, the number of kids, does it feel like a community? Do they feel, do they feel um, part of something? And, and, uh, and we, we really have to tackle that and make sure that that is addressed. That's, that's my answer to it. I think you're right. Building the small neighborhoods is really important within a larger setting if that is what the town decides. Um, on a social emotional end, it does bring all of our key specialists into one building. Right now, some of them travel. And now some of our real key um, support staff for social emotional health and well-being would all be in one location which would be a plus really good point okay i'm gonna skip around a little bit so there was another question asked by um i believe neil duffy rebecca brown mentioned that she would recommend the middle school traffic improvements even if that site is not selected which i agree with does she feel similarly about some of the proposed improvements at Stanley and in the Hadley area? Again, even if those sites are not selected. Yeah, so absolutely there are some of those improvements that we would recommend regardless. Um, formalizing the one-way traffic pattern around Stanley would certainly help for being able to um, to provide sidewalks that are wide enough and don't um, don't have trees growing up through them um, and would allow you to keep the historic trees in that area. Um, and also for improving the pedestrian crossings um, out on Humphrey Street and upgrading that deficient intersection down at Humphrey and Atlantic. Those would all be things that could be done now. Um, as far as at the Hadley School, definitely um, getting those vehicles that are parked in the crosswalk out of the crosswalk is a huge benefit. Um, so putting those bump outs, which um, are shown on the diagram as, as number three here, um, that would be an added, added benefit. Um, improving that area between Rockland Street and King Street where there's that wide open pavement in that area. Those are all things that could be done now to improve um, the safety. And even potentially converting Reddington Street to one way could be done now. Um, to help alleviate traffic if that was something that was desired. But some of the other more minor improvements could be done now. Okay, thank you. Again, skipping around, I'm gonna go down to uh, Derek. Does, doesn't the middle school option have the rail trail run right through the site and the middle of the proposed parking lot? It does, yes. Um, yeah, so you can see here that dashed line um, where the proposed rail trail is. So it does come right through here um, and kind of go right through the parking lot and back out. Um, so that's something that certainly would need to be considered. And we hadn't looked at where that rail trail would necessarily go if the school was in that location. Um, it could potentially be like a, a shared use path passing in front of the school. Um, but yeah, it, it does in fact pass through there. Yeah, and just, just to um, also add to that, 
you know, it's, it's really quite close to the Stanley site as well. So it would be very, a future rail trail would be a great help to um, bikers and walkers to both of those schools. Okay, thank you. Next question, gonna kind of pick out of turn, but, um, but traffic will compound, as you mentioned down at Hadley, parents get there early and hang out. I did it myself many years ago. Thank you for that observation. I don't feel like it uh, needs an actual response, but we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. I think in, in general, at in the afternoons are always um, very different than in the morning. In the morning, people are queuing in and out. In the afternoons, people show up quite early and wait. And we have to really, I know Rebecca has been talking about this with us, um, really have places for people to queue and wait to pick up their kids in the afternoons so they don't block traffic. Okay, thank you. Next question, um, just kind of skipping around. Mary asked, thank you so much for this great analysis and presentation. Looking forward to learning more next week. Thank you, Mary. Mary's the best. <laughs> so we have five more questions and I'll run through these in order. Wait, Vivian, can I ask a question from the emails? Sure. Um, someone asked, please provide additional detail as to why the Clark School site is not being considered. Oh, that's, that's fairly easy. Um, the Abbott Park next to Clark is not, um, a, we are not able to um, utilize that. It is a park that was given certain funds, I guess, uh, grants or something like that and can't be changed or moved. Um, so in order to build, and the Clark site is very, 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 just the Clark building site itself, it's very, very small. Um, this is the Hadley building, so we have to um, change the, we have to replace the Hadley. Um, and with a tiny site that is there, it'd be very difficult to, um, to do anything there. Um, I think when we, I don't know if that's a very good answer, maybe it's getting late. But <laughs> It's, we can't use the Abbott, we can't use Abbott. We'd have to tear down the Clark and build something. It would probably be five stories tall in order to fit much. Um, so okay. that's why we haven't. Um, there, was, there was an additional question about the rail trail and was it considered, was the, did you consider, um, this is for Rebecca, the potential rail trail and the study of traffic and the effect it would have on traffic and walkability? So we didn't um, actually calculate anything for it, but certainly for the Stanley School, because it does run so close, um, we did mention that providing a connection to, um, to the rail trail could potentially increase the walking and the biking to the school um, as an option. And certainly for the middle school site as well, because it runs through there. Um, it's also close to the DPW site, so that could be a benefit for the DPW site, but there were so many other issues that that site had to overcome that I'm not sure it, it would make much of a difference at that location. All right, and there's one more question here about um, the elementary school at the middle school site. It was soundly voted down, um, mainly due to traffic and younger, older student congestion concerns. The three ball fields were moved from Jackson Park for the high school construction to the middle school site. One is a little league field, another a softball field, and the third a senior little league, Babe Ruth, the, the 90 foot field, but that's the third one. They each support unique needs and are not redundant. Finding a new site for the first field would be problematic. This is all very true. <laughs> um, Again, we, we looked at how could we possibly use this site um, because it existed and there was actual space there and you know that you have very little space in town, but all the things you just said are verifiable, verifiably true. All right, that's it for, so go ahead, Vivian. I, I, I do want to say that there was some questions about Phillips. Um, I don't know if the person who wrote them earlier is on here, but we will be talking about 
uh, Phillips Park and all of its environmental issues and flooding issues next week at, at length. Uh, next question that just came in, and I think actually is a great question to ask. We have very few wild and open spaces in Swanscott. Would a school at Stanley negatively impact that? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, the Stanley, if we built a Stanley school, we would just be building right on the parking. Uh, sorry, right on the field that's already. Um, that's already uh, flat and being used as a play field. And then what happens is the Stanley School gets, after that's done, Stanley School gets taken away and that becomes the open space park. So it's just a flip. And we do not um, impact or touch the uh, conservation land around it to the side of it at all. So Stanley is a wonderful place for sustainable um, and teaching and learning having that conservation land right next door where the kids have been using it for years. And we wouldn't but, have to touch yeah. any of the, uh, we wouldn't have to impose any of the article 97 since we're giving the same amount of space, what open space back. Uh, and it's also, it's a field it's owned, right. but it's owned by a, a school. So yeah, we are extremely conscious of the environmental, uh, impact of this and that's a really pretty clean site to deal with. Thank you for that question. Great one. Next one. Will tonight's slide deck be shared with the public? Yes, we will make these slide decks definitely uh, available to the public on the school committee website. Please check back as well as next week's. In, in addition, this broadcast it will probably run on the cable, uh, can run on the town cable channel too. Perfect, thank you. So now we have five more questions and I'll go through those in order if that's okay. Educational vision. What question was, how does the K through four fit the educational vision of removing grade five from Swamscott Middle School? In that case, it does not. Thank uh, you. Right? I, I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to be tertiary. It, it actually, it does not Correct. Um, solve, that, so, solve that issue. Grade five issue won't be solved until middle school is rebuilt to accommodate fifth graders in a architectural facility way. Don't know. Okay. Um, Thank you for the insight. What happened to the task force recommendation of updating the master plan? Anybody from Swam Scott? Oh, Pam. Pam, are you still there? Uh, I think she had to drop off. Oh. Um. Um, the master plan, that's still, there, there, is, there is currently no master plan. This, we're, we're sort of hoping, we're sort of hoping this building and what it becomes, if it's a K through four, a three through five, or another Hadley school, um, the K through four Hadley, that's going to dictate, uh, that's going to be the first step of the, of the new master plan because as we decide what the configuration option for this school will be, that will lead us to develop the plan for the remainder. It's the best I can okay. best I can answer that right now. Thank you. In a previous answer to another question, there was mention of a potential grade one through five site. It was my understanding that the grade configurations attached to each of the four options were approved by the MSBA. If we change grade configurations at any of these options, does this require MSBA approval? Yes, it does require MSBA approval. For the first option, which is the K-4, uh, we are in conversations with the MSBA. Unfortunately, we do not have approval to proceed at this point for, for that option to be changed from a K-4 through four to a 1-5. through five. I'm sure once this pandemic has been lifted and a little bit more 
interaction with the MSBA can be made, we'll uh, quickly receive an answer for that question. Thank you. Last question. To be clear, the town did not get the vote on the number of sections per grade. This was a key reason why the last vote failed. The schools reduced to two sections per grade without support from the town since a vote was not required. Have you considered adding more classrooms and reducing class sizes to help with voter support? I wish that Pam was here to, uh, to discuss that. Um, Jaron, can I ask that uh, if you're still on and listening, can you please send that question through um, the website in hopes that we could get a better answer to you? I apologize that we don't have one at this moment, but would love to respond to you formally. If that's, Thank yeah. you. That was the last of the questions. If there is nothing further, anybody else have any comments? Any further questions? If not, I would like to thank everybody for your participation as well as Rebecca and the LBA, entire LBA team for all of your efforts for tonight's presentation. Thank you so much. As mentioned, these slide decks will be made available as well as this entire presentation for your viewing pleasure. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. See you, See you next week. Good night. See you next week. Night.